Okay, recording in progress. Um, thank you very much, and thanks for all of for coming in this uh, last uh, midsummer uh, seminar and after a, uh, a big night for most of us. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, share screen. Uh, is it working? You can see my. Can you? Yes, excellent. Okay, so. Um, well, thank you very much. So let me uh, get started. Um, this is a uh, joint with uh, Antonin Massé uh, at Paris School and Matthias Nunez at uh, Polytechnique, uh, both in Paris. And uh, um, it is uh, uh, a paper where I was inspired by uh, the, the aftermath of the Brexit. Um, and so uh, we came um, to think about the following. Um, so if you um, wanted to think about what is uh, political brinkmanship in negotiations. So this word, if you look it up on the dictionary, uh, it says it's the art or practice of pushing a dangerous situation or confrontation uh, to the limits of safety and maybe to force a desired outcome. Um, and so um, examples, notable examples of that are, for example, uh, in the US, the US debt ceiling crisis, for example, are situations in which the two uh, parties in the US are you know, bargaining and trying to decide on a budget. And then one side unilaterally decides to say, until we find an agreement, I'm not going to raise the debt ceiling. So any day we don't find an agreement, we have uh, a risk of defaulting on the US debt. Okay, but evidently defaulting on U.S. debt uh, is something that would hurt dramatically the whole U.S., both sides, both parties. Maybe one party more than the other, politically or not, that's debatable, but it's, uh, it's damaging to all. And so it pushes somehow the negotiation on the brink of a collapse and puts them there, you know, the, the two sides on, uh, you know, at the brink of a precipice where they're trying to negotiate with the risk of falling down at any moment. And so um, this is a brinkmanship situation. And you can think of it the same way in the US government shutdowns when they don't agree and they shut down the government that any day that the government shut down, it just hurts both parties. In the UK case, uh, similarly, um, the Brexit negotiations were characterized by this type of situation in which you know, there were these uh, hard Brexit deadlines that were put in several locations there to try to prompt an agreement, right? And if uh, the two parties didn't agree, you felt you had the risk of falling off a cliff and uh, having a hard Brexit that would hurt uh, the UK dramatically. Uh, and so, um, uh, so here, um, the Brexit situation uh, is uh, essentially is looking at uh, a situation that it's been five years of, of, uh, of turmoil, right? And, uh, and so since uh, the referendum, there's been several deals that have been negotiated in Brussels and then they were brought to the UK parliament and the MPs had a, this unwillingness to compromise and rejected these deals and they were sent back to Brussels, negotiated in Brussels again, brought back to the UK, voted down again, sent to Brussels again. And this problem became uh, this, uh, you know, called the kicking the can down the road problem. And some people thought that they would disagree forever. They would never have Brexit, this, you know, they would never agree and would continue in this default limbo situation, right? And so the response to that by several sides, uh, UK presidents, I mean, uh, prime ministers, but also uh, in the EU, EU side, several countries said, enough is enough. Uh, we're going to put a hard deadline now. It's this deal is the last deal, and then if we don't agree on this deal, it's a hard Brexit that will you know this this, this bomb will explode and we'll all get a bad outcome. So please agree now. Evidently, then these threat didn't materialize. The extensions were given, but it wasn't clear that they were going to be given for sure, right? And so every time these deals happen, you know the pound took a hit, and there were this type of uh, you know brinkmanship situation in place to try to force an, an outcome uh, and solve the kicking down 
the can down the road problem. And so um, there is this, we wanna study uh, these uh, do or die threats. Uh, and, uh, and so what are these do or die threats? They are uh, negotiation, negotiation ending threats. And so this hard breakdown, you can think of it as worse than any possible deal agreed by the parties. And worse also than a default outside option, the source of no deal limbo option, right? Um, and so you, you can think of it, you're putting a Damocles sword on top of a negotiation or a time bomb that is there uh, to try to get some, uh, some action maybe and you wanna see what this does effectively, that's the goal of the paper, okay? Um, and so um, the key to these threats is that they're neither, they're probabilistic in nature. If these threats, this, you know, this hard deadline is put there, uh, you know, this my way or the highway, this deal is the last one, and then maybe it is, maybe it isn't, right? And so they're not, uh, you know, uh, chance one events for sure. It's not a hard deadline because it can be extended maybe. Uh, or, you know, in the debt ceiling, you know, that you're going to default on the debt tomorrow for sure, but you may. And so it's not a chance zero event either. Uh, and, and we can see it because these things affect financial markets. So, you know, the US debt was, you know, downgraded for the first time in its history in these situations, uh, for example, too. And so we think of uh, brinkmanship uh, as uh, the, the key feature of this brinkmanship somehow is. Uh, as Schelling puts it, is this threat that leaves something to chance. In some sense, um, when you uh, put this threat on, is somehow uh, the cat is out of the box, right? And uh, there's something you cannot control about it once this off. So as Schelling puts it, the key to these threats is that though then the threatening side may carry them out or not, uh, the decision is not altogether under the threatness control because there's risk that could involve chance, accident, third party influence, imperfection of the machinery, and things we don't understand once you trigger this thing. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and so our goal, our agenda here, it's pretty simple in a sense. We, we're not for now. Okay. So, um, this is still work in progress and we're thinking of other things to do, but a necessary first step is uh, not to worry about um, the implementation of this brinkmanship or the credibility of the threats. First, we wanna think about, suppose this threat is there. Suppose you have a two parties bargaining and you put this Damocles thought on top of this bargaining situation, somehow exogenously is there, this, this uh, brinkmanship situation. So what happens? Well, how does this change outcomes and who would benefit uh, and how? And is it desirable? So if from a normative side, if somebody could put this threat out there uh, externally to the negotiation, for example, would he want to, right? Or would she want to? Okay, so that's, uh, that's where we're trying to go. Uh, and- uh, Elios, uh, before you go on, so, oh, so maybe yeah. you're, gonna, you're gonna you're going to explain this better. But uh, uh, so one can think of this as a um, like a two possible events, uh, and you you could take the average of it, right? You could say, well, I think this is going to happen some probability. That's going to happen some probability. So this sort of a def if this thing happens, this is what I I have an expectation. But um, so are you going to have some form of limited liability here? Something so something that something that can happen that really goes bad or something like that, or, because I, I'm naturally thinking that this would matter either under risk aversion or with risk neutrality, but some form of limited liability. You, you can't afford a particularly bad event or something like that, or am I missing something? Um, you can't afford, I mean, um, in what sense are you thinking about this? So you, if you think situations like, Brexit or, you know, the hard Brexit chance, so the, the US debt ceiling, um, then, you know, uh, these things could have happened, right? It's not that they were chance zero events. And that's, that's all we're trying uh, to model. But by the way, do you see all these prompts I get on my screen or do I only see them? No, we, we don't see any. I, I can see 
part of my screen because of the whole problem. Yeah. Um, uh, now, so I'll try to be more explicit. So, you know, if I have a random variable, if brinkmanship, you know, if the deadline is missed, there's a random variable. This random variable will have a distribution and it will have a mean. And this mean is what basically my, my default option, right? If we don't agree, this is what we get. That's, that's standard, right? So what would, the, it's just that it's probabilistic, but, but you know, what I care about is the average. Uh, so I'm missing what you're you're gonna change from that. You obviously have something different in mind. But let me. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. So let me introduce a little bit the model, okay. and maybe okay. you can tell me which which part of the model is not uh, is um, okay. okay. Yeah, because I'm I'm not. Um, I, I fear I'll, I'll be answering something a little different from what you are, are asking. So let let's uh, let's get more into the details, and this is pretty simple. So, so you, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll see. So, um, so the, the, the broad framework is very simple in a sense. So we're thinking about uh, just exogenous proposals. So there's a proposal agreement is presented for ratification. When it comes from Brussels, it's given to the UK parliament. And so here is, you know, a deal. Mm -hmm. And then if ratification fails, then you go back to Brussels and a new deal is drawn. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, does it, you don't know what deal will be drawn exactly. And so, you know, the body that decides the final approval, uh, maybe we can establish some red lines there on what deals, but then the negotiation is, is done by a lot of, uh, there's a lot of technical details and technical teams on both sides there. And so you, there's some residual uncertainties on what deal you're gonna get next, if you reject the current one, right? You don't know that. So that has to be some uh, uncertainty there. Um, and so we, we do it in the most simple way. Maybe we could complicate things a little bit, but the deals are for now, as you'll see, uh, taken exogen. So you reject that. And so, and then you'll get a new one, right? That's the simplest possible thing. And we can talk about extensions there. Uh, I, so I guess the, the thing that's really different from the standard bargaining model I have in mind is that the proposals are exogenous. So basically, the, it's like a bargaining model where the two sides actually don't get to choose the proposal. They're not endogenous to the to the sides, basically. Okay. That's right. That's right. Uh, so um, we could extend this and make it, you know, partly, you know, endogenous. We're thinking about ways to do that. But the key thing is that there should be some residual uncertainty in these deals. So you don't know what deal is going to come out of that, right? Um, uh, so, okay, so there's a key point here, distinction to make between discounting and brinkmanship. So there is the time discounting in these models, as in all models, and so it's pressed by the parameter beta. And if it's less than one, that means this, there's a pi that we're sharing, it shrinks at every period, okay? And so every period you don't get anything, you get zero and then the pie is smaller. If you never agree on anything, then overall you get zero, okay? So that's kind of the status quo limbo in a sense. Suppose, you know, we continue in this uncertain situation where we're negotiating Brexit and there's never a deal agreed, but we continue that way. And by the way, uh, in the UK was supposed to enter uh, the Euro and never agreed and negotiation went on and they're still in theory going on. Um, so there's this limbo there and it's never gonna happen. Um, so that's the time discounting part. And then brinkmanship is different. It's a situation in which there's an exogenous chance that in never, if uh, an agreement fails, then that implies a hard breakdown and that gives a negative pie, right? Possibly heterogeneous, but negative payoffs to both. So you'll never uh, want that, uh, okay? Um, and so where does this fit in the literature? Uh, after we built the model, we discovered that actually uh, Comte GDL had the uh, same kind of framework uh, in, a, in, their, uh, in some of their paper where there's this stochastic proposal. So it's like a collective search model where these proposals are for now entirely uh, exogenous as, as Francesco was saying. Um, but essentially we do that to get some element of stochasticity. We could, we're thinking a way of partly endogenizing them, but what's key is that there has to be some stochasticity in, in proposals. 
And some people have done that, right? In, in all models of bargaining where you get delay, different models of bargaining where the, there's endogenous parts to the, the bargaining part. Uh, there are uh, stochasticity maybe not in the deals, but in the preferences. And so that means, you know, there is, uh, you know, you don't know, maybe you know the deal you're gonna get tomorrow, but you don't know how much you're gonna like it. <laughs> so it's just kind of a, at the same kind of situation that generates delay because you might, you know, I'll wait another period to see if the next deal I like it more, right? And then similarly, there's these models of bargaining where, uh, you know, the pie uh, changes and stuff. So there's some elements of randomness just to get some delay. We do the simplest possible thing just to get delay. And then we're gonna put on top of that, this springmanship to see what it does to welfare and delay and all this kicking the can down the road problems as well you mentioned, right? On another, so our model is going to be very stationary, um, but on another strand of literature, they look at negotiations on the tight deadlines. So it's kind of the opposite of that. It's like, you know, this situation in which there's a tight deadline, so at period 10, uh, you fall off the cliff for sure and never before, right? And so these are highly non stationary timing games, and you're just looking at these models and various variations of them look at situation in which you know you have agreements on the eleventh hour and and see what happens in this tight deadline. So it's kind of complementary to what we do because we have full stationarity there. Okay, so that's you know a non-comprehensive uh, view of the literature. Um, has any questions before I start more into the details? Yeah, I have a. You had a, a, a slide before the literature on on delta and age. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, so, so so delta beta, you mean the beat is beta also could be interpreted as a as a time or as the probability with which the relationship breaks down and we revert to some kind of status quo. So I'm I'm still not entirely sure what's the difference between beta and age. Is just that what happens after there is a breakdown, the 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 status quo or or the, the default position? Is that the difference only between the two? So operationally, mathematically, they act very uh, similarly in the sense they are like you know uh, some kind of uh, um, H acts operationally, mathematically similarly to beta, except it can give negative outcomes and these outcomes can be heterogeneous between the two parties so more one more negative than the other okay and it acts on top of the beta so it's a stationary situation a stationary time bomb that can explode at any moment and uh, it can give negative uh, outcomes we interpret them differently in a sense we interpret beta as some kind of you know shrinking pie every period and beta as some kind of uh, explosion that can happen but, but operationally, uh, they they act uh, uh, mathematically in a similar way. But they are exogenous, both of them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All right. So yeah, let me start very simply uh, for exposition's sake with a simple one-agent framework. So this is just one agent, right? And he has uh, uh, preferences. He has a bliss point. And uh, at point B, where he gets utility of one, okay, and then the status quo payoff is zero. So if uh, he never agrees on any deal, he'll get zero. Mm -hmm. And so his worst acceptable deal is x equal to b minus one, which gives him zero. And that's standard. Then on top of that, if brinkmanship happens, if there's a time bomb that explodes on him, then he'll get a negative payoff d negative. Okay. So a way to visualize this is that. And so the agents in every period will, uh, will have a bliss point at B, but exogenous will get deals out of a set X, will give him, give him positive utility from his utility of zero to a maximal utility that is bounded by some exogenous constraint G, which in the two, period, two agent model will represent the other guy. But this agent design of doing a search problem is getting deal in, in every period from X, and he decides to accept or reject. If he rejects, he goes to the next period and gets another deal X, right? The trick is that, so every period he gets a proposal and if he uh, accepts or rejects, if he rejects, then if there is brinkmanship H, so if H is not zero, then he 
with that probability, he can get a negative outcome and um, you know, he, he falls into a hard a Brexit situation or a hard outcome situation. If not, he goes into the next period, right? Standard with beta, okay? So very simple search problem. And so the solution to this is that there is an acceptance set, right? Uh, in which the it defines the set of uh, deals that the agent will accept and is defined by the utility being larger than his reservation value or continuation value, which is, you know, if there is a hard outcome with chance H, he will get that next period if he rejects. And if not, with chance one of minus H, he won't get the hard outcome. He'll go to the next period discounted by beta and he'll calculate his expected utility if he agrees in the, if he gets a deal in the agreement set. And if not, he'll reject and it will go to the next period. So it's a stationary problem. And so simply this gives a unique uh, stationary optimal strategy, which is a set A. And uh, maybe the best way is to show this picture very simply. When H, this is brinkmanship is zero default. So there's just time discounting beta. He accepts these deals, the difference between the red and the blue line. But as uh, um, H increases, so the chance of a hard outcome becomes more, you know, palpable anytime he rejects the deal. He becomes more, he compromises more and accepts more and more deals. Okay. And so the kicking down the can down the road problem is mitigated this way, pretty simply. Um, the, the welfare is also very simple. It can be expressed very simply uh, mathematically. But the key point here is that the welfare is negative, of course, for this agent, if you put brinkmanship upon him, uh, he'll accept more deals, but that's bad for welfare. And one thing that can happen is that, in fact, the bomb can go off. Um, you know, you put you the ticking bomb on him, he'll accept more deals, but he also may reject the deal. And then the hard deadline may hit him and he might, might get a negative payoff. So there's a probability that this, uh, you know, he falls off the cliff in a sense here. That's positive up to a point. I have a clarifying question. So yeah. D, D is this payoff, the, the, the negative payoff when the disaster strikes? Correct. Uh, after, after the hard Brexit, yes. Yeah. What's the difference between D and D star? Because you have D star here. Oh, so, the, no, so D is the, is the, val, the utility of it, and D star is the, just the, the event. <laughs> ah, <laughs> okay. Nothing, okay. nothing deep. The event and the, the, the payoff is D. And so there's a two uh, side model now that the um, full blown model we're looking at. So there's two sides. And they both have a bliss point, same as before, that they're different, B0 less than B1. There's a polarization G, which tells you how far apart they are. And the agents have a hard breakdown. So the event is D, uh, and then they get negative payoffs, D theta, each one of them. So they're negative for both. So it's a bad outcome, disaster outcome for both. But there's one advantage agent, uh, we call it agents one, which gets a less negative uh, outcome than the other guy, okay? If they both uh, fall off this cliff and a hard Brexit comes up, okay? Uh, so think of, you know, Boris Johnson saying, my way or the highway, there's a deal here, this is the last deal or we'll go for hard Brexit. And then there's the other side, labor and stuff. And, you know, why is he doing that? Well, you know, maybe, you know, he thinks hard Brexit will hurt more the other side or not. Um, that, that's the way we're trying to think of, or the debt ceiling, same way we're putting on a debt ceiling, and, you know, um, that, that's, that's the situation, general situation we're looking at. And so this is the picture, uh, there's bliss points here, and then they'll accept only, they'll consider only deals within a set X, in any period, they'll get a deal out of set X, they'll have these utilities from them, and both agents simultaneously choose whether to accept or reject a deal in the set. And uh, the timing is as follows, is oops, if uh, any agent, uh, so the deals are drawn uniformly, if any agents reject a deal, then there is, uh, in the default case, you go to the next period. If there is brinkmanship on, depending on how strong it is, 
But if this brink one show up, you can have a hard breakdown with some chance. And the hard breakdown gives negative payoff. You have a hard Brexit and the game ends. So here, uh, the stationary equilibrium uh, um, is, uh, is calculated as follows the same way. Each one has a reservation value in every period and uh, which is the same as before, um, as I described before. And so a stationary equilibrium will exist here. And so uh, I won't describe this because it's pretty clear. It's just what I said before for one agent, just for two agents at the same time. Um, and so the outcome here is the following. So if brinkmanship on this x-axis is zero, you'll see we'll have an agreement set that is, is pretty small. So there's a severe uh, kick in the can down the road problems. Only deals that come within this set are accepted. Most of them are rejected here. Um, but as uh, brinkmanship becomes more prominent, as you made a hard deadline more credible and uh, uh, a hard Brexit more credible if a deal is not accepted, then people will accept more deals, right? And that's the way somehow Brexit was passed eventually. Uh, and so people become, both agents become more lenient and you accept more and more deals until uh, if the brinkmanship is high enough, then everybody, uh, all deals are accepted. This is a symmetric model. So the deals are symmetric around the center line, which is uh, the pink line, okay? In this symmetric version in which the hard Brexit negative outcome is the same for both parties. And this is the only uh, either originality will switch on at some point. Sorry, why is it a symmetric model if you have difference between those penalties D? So in this model, sorry, the Ds are the same in the symmetric model. That's what symmetric model means. Thanks. Um, so, um, okay, but the interesting part, so this is okay, fair enough. So the kicking the can down the road problem kind of solved, but at a cost, right? Because here, as soon as you switch on brinkmanship, you accept more deals, but some deals you do reject and you might meet the deadline. And then at the deadline, we may all fall into a hard Brexit situation or the debt ceiling hits and we default on our debt, right? And so in equilibrium, we will have, as soon as H is positive, we will have the chance uh, that we, the situation pushed on the brink falls from this brink. And so, um, and the welfare is gonna take that into account. Uh, which means, so the lesson two here, so we have a simple expression for welfare, which is symmetric for the two agents, but the brinkmanship health compromise, uh, so solves the kicking down, uh, the crown down the road problem, but it's ambiguous on welfare, right? So here, uh, welfare, you can see that's breaking down in two parts. One is when you get the agreement, and one is what kind of payoff you get from that agreement, including the chance that you fall off this cliff. And as H becomes bigger, you get an agreement faster, but the payoff from the agreement or an outcome faster, which could be a deal or a hard Brexit, but because there's a chance of hard Brexit, the payoff you get from this eventual outcome can be negative in expectation. So there's a trade-off between these two parts here, which, uh, um, can be probably uh, expressed best in this picture. And so here you see that uh, uh, in case of severe disagreement, so if there is a severe kick in the can down the road problem, so there's a small set of agreements that we agree upon, and most of the times we send the deal back to Brussels, right? Then putting brinkmanship on this situation where we have little agreement to begin with, is actually bad for welfare because as you put brinkmanship in there, there is a very high chance, though we agree more, so we kick the can down the problem, uh, down the road less, we do have a problem of uh, a higher chance, a very high chance that we fall off the cliff here. And so welfare actually uh, drops. Uh, initially. And this is a key situation which when we think about Brexit, we think is the case because in the Brexit situation, there was very little room for compromise the beginning. Parties were compromising less. And then these threats were also, you know, where they were there. Uh, 
they were positive, but mild in a sense. So H was low. And so we think that was a negative effect, at least in the symmetric model um, that did uh, this one negative effect to welfare, right? And so the, the punchline, the lesson here is uh, that in severe disagreements to begin with, you put the situation on the brink and uh, uh, you solve the kicking them down the can on the road problem. I can't say today because I had a little sleep last <laughs> night, but, um, but you, you can fall, you, this time bomb may go off, okay? And so you get, uh, you get a U-shaped uh, welfare. If the, you know, if you don't need uh, brinkmanship, paradoxically, if you don't need brinkmanship uh, very much because there is already a large chance of agreement to begin with, then welfare will be increasing. But paradoxically, when you do need it the most to solve a severe, you know, lack of compromise problem, then it does solve it, but it's bad for, for welfare, which is the situation. Elios, uh, before you go on, Am I interpreting this wrong? That, but the red line eventually goes up if H is large enough. Yeah. So if you have a guts of putting a ridiculously high chance of the the fall, then that you will have immediate agreement, presumably, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So if uh, if brinkmanship is, is high enough, and if there's this, these threats are fully credible, of course, uh, then then parties will agree on everything, right? Uh, so we're starting this norm that we say, so yes, so, but what is the reality is that these, so yeah, so first the nuclear is, war, right? This is nuclear war or something. Nuclear like war with chance one. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Nuclear war with chance one does it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the thing is that it wasn't that, right? So, um, and so that's the, the situation. These were like small, yeah, 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 and yeah. so that's the whole- uh, The low H is the interesting case. Right, we think so. Yeah, or, or 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 the not so high D's because presumably the D's do a similar. They do do a job too, but um, yeah. Can I can I ask a clarifying question because I missed something when you moved from single person to two people. What's mm -hmm. the nature of of the game between two people? So, if they they they, they have to both agree for the agreement to be uh, to be accepted. If yeah. any one of them says no, or both of them say no, then they go to the next period and then H kicks in or not. Correct. I see. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Just as in Brexit, that's what we're thinking. You know, we, we disagree, you know, Labour votes this down. And then I said, oh, there's a hard deadline. And is it, is, Europe, is saying, Europe is saying, no, we won't give you another deal. That's it. This is, uh, and then, but then they did in the end. And so, okay, so we're going to get another deal. And but we, the whole parliament has to vote. For it, right, and so eventually, um, okay. through okay, this through this thing, they that's that's what we have in mind. I don't know if we're still good at modeling it, but that's that's uh, it's just realistic the way we model. It. No, because I was thinking about about whether H can be interpreted as a commitment power. So large H means that we have to agree right now, whatever it is. But then the problem is that uh, it might be just a small X, you know, bad for both of us. Is it a, a zero? This is what I don't get. Is it a zero sum kind of thing? Yes, it, it's a zero. It's a constant sum game. It's a pie. Yeah, people are sharing a pie, right? Exactly. Uh, and so, uh, right. So this is the pie here, and uh, it has this size. And so, you know, in this, you get all the pie. In this, you get all the pie. And here, we share the pie if it's in the middle. Exactly. So, right? so H is a, a, a commitment. Describes a, a commitment. How long the game will last, essentially. If H is close to one, then we have to accept. Uh, In equilibrium, you, you would accept anything because you're sure you're going to fall off this cliff. It, it would be similar to these models of a hard deadline models in which you have to agree. Uh, yes, but the, the difference the difference between uh, Jehiel and uh, Comte is that the pie arrives different size every period, and therefore there is a benefit for wait in waiting for a large pie. Right, so That's GL and Comte, I don't know if, which one has a large pie, but the main difference is that they have no age, <laughs> right? So, so that's the whole uh, the whole point. We, we, we're not doing anything special. We're taking their model, a little less general, and putting the age on it. Okay, okay, I'm, so I'll stop here. We'll, we'll talk later. 
All right. Um, okay. So, okay. Now, now maybe uh, we'll go to the asymmetric case, which is um, maybe more interesting. And so this is a situation in which the brinkmanship hurts both parties, but hurts one party more than the other. So one party, party one is advantaged. And so we want to think about, can this brinkmanship be used by one party to gain some bargaining advantage, to gain a better utility? We want to see if that works or not. What does it do for welfare? Is there equilibrium chance of, uh, of falling off this cliff again? And, and whatnot, okay? And so, uh, again, uh, in this situation, uh, the situation is more complex. There's a stationary equilibrium, which we focus on, that has different three parts. Um, maybe this picture is simpler. So for small bring, so for zero brinkmanship, the, the, the thing is symmetric because there'll be never a hard outcome. And so the parties are fully symmetric. And so these deals are centered around zero on a small set, okay, so they disagree. But as brinkmanship is put on, and you put the situation on the brink of a precipice, then, well, one thing that happens is that they accept more deals, so they both become more uh, lenient. So the kicking down, the can down the road problem is, is partly solved, uh, not fully solved, so there's still a chance of a hard Brexit here when they fall, deals fall outside of the set. But crucially, the average deals instantaneously moves towards the advantaged party. That is the party that is hurt, but is hurt less than the other side from a possible hard break. Okay, so he gains an advantage first for small h, and that's the key thing we want to focus on. And then for large h, for very large h, we accept all deals as before. And for intermediate h, there's a region in which one party accepts everything, and the other party is uh, is accepting only something. So it's, it's kind of one side. Okay, but the key part we want to focus in is again is the small h here, which is what we think it's more uh, what we observe in reality. And so, if you look at welfare, as probably the picture is best, the welfare you see you see uh, total welfare is pink, and then is the welfare of the two sides blue and red. You see the advantaged guy for he would like, and what we observe in reality, it's small uh, brinkmanship, he gets an immediate welfare advantage here, and the other guy is hurt. And so uh, if he could, he would uh, use this H uh, to gain an advantage, even though there's a risk of a hard Brexit or a debt ceiling hitting and defaulting on the debt in the US uh, on path, okay? And the disadvantage is obviously very disadvantaged at first, and the total welfare is goes below what it is without brinkmanship. Okay, so we start from the same welfare, and then the welfare is sort of split apart right off the bat uh, with small brinkmanship right there. Okay, so uh, the theorem here is that equilibrium welfare of agent one is is maximal for a small threat h. And whereas the other guy, and in, for this level, a hard outcome may occur in path. Uh, and for the other guy, uh, you know, he wants a maximal threat because that will agree that, uh, you know, the, the, the hard outcome never occurs. But the bad guy would want to make this threat because that's even better than agreeing any deal uh, uh, from the start. Um, if the zero delay cost, so if there's no delay, so if there's you know very severe disagreement to begin with, absent brinkmanship, you see that even in any small hint of H immediately creates an advantage for uh, for the advantage party as the deal immediately jumps and and favors him and drops from the average zero into his side. Okay, so if there's severe disagreement, that's very strong, uh, even stronger this effect. And the welfare also is super strong. So even, he could be even slightly credible in the deal you make and you have a less of a cost of a hard Brexit than the other side, you would be. Uh, that, that would immediately have an effect. Okay, so that's maybe a key insight here. Um, um, 
And so let me uh, just open, uh, skip this part and, and talk about what we want to do next. Uh, we think the model is, uh, uh, um, could use more work in several aspects. So we're trying to think that the standard thing to do is think about a second step, right? So, so we had an exogenous age, so this could be a normative outcome, you know, some exogenous external agent putting this age upon a negotiation and seeing what happens, what, you know, does it solve the kicking the can down the road problem? Does it improve welfare? What happens there? Um, and so that was a necessary first step to understand when you put the switch on the age, what happens to the deal, to how much we agree, to the chance of hard Brexit, to welfare, all this stuff. But, uh, you know, um, so now that we've done that, uh, we want to try to think about uh, how uh, to endogenize that, how we, you know, if, if one, one agent, maybe the advantage agent could choose that, how would we do that? We haven't uh, found a setting yet. We're thinking about necessarily, it seems like maybe you guys have uh, better ideas, but it seems to be that asymmetric information setup uh, should be at the core of this. So there should be uncertainty either on the cost of uh, losing credibility if you make a threat and then you renege on it, or maybe there should be uncertainty on the hard outcome. You know, uh, if you, you know, um, there's uncertainty on how hard um, my outcome is, then I can make I can make a threat and you don't know. So it becomes kind of a signaling game, which is uh, much more more complicated to solve. Those are two options we have there, uh, which we are thinking about. Um, um, the other part we're thinking about is to endogenize a little more the bargaining, which is uh, seems to be very, uh, you know, it, it's very reduced form because it's uh, come to yell a reduced form, a kind of a collective search model where these deals are, are totally exogenous and not repeated. But we need some randomness there. And so well, in this last five minutes, uh, so what are the takeaways here? So the main takeaways are, okay, so brinkmanship does increase agreement scope. You kick the can down the road less. Welfare though is convex and it's especially bad uh, if uh, in severe disagreements, uh, if there's severe disagreement, a little bit of brinkmanship, which is what we seem to observe in all these cases is bad for welfare in all cases. In the asymmetric case though, a little bit of brinkmanship does benefit the advantage side, the guy that's hurt, albeit less by uh, the hard Brexit. And, and so the advantage side would like this small branch as you gain an advantage. Uh, and, but that's bad for welfare, it's bad for the welfare of, of the other guy and it's bad for um, all welfare. So what, what's the moral of the story here? We're, we're gonna run the conclusions here. Um, so. I think, so this brinkmanship tactic here, uh, so the hard Brexit deadlines or uh, the US debt ceilings, they were brinkmanship episodes and they were triggered unilaterally by one side, you know, uh, the Republicans in, in the US and the Tories here in the UK. And this brinkmanship tactic was not uncredible. So, you know, was maybe, not have not a lot of credibility. Nobody thought really that the US was going to default on its debt or that we're gonna have a hard Brexit, but it wasn't zero, the chance. And the chance of you know a bad outcome was there because it affected the threats, affected financial markets. Uh, the US debt uh, spreads and the pound were took up a severe hit during this announcement. So the threat was there to some extent. And so this low credibility and large initial disagreements uh, implies that brinkmanship, uh, though it may have speeded things up and we agreed faster, was bad for overall welfare and the risk of a hard outcome uh, was real. But the side that triggered the brinkmanship uh, must have had or must have believed it had a lower cost or maybe a lower political cost than the other side. Uh, of this possible uh, hard outcome. Um, and so use this strategically uh, to gain some welfare uh, advantage. Now you may think uh, this was a political cost or not. This was in the head 
uh, in the crazy head of Boris Johnson or of Trump in the shutdown or of the Republicans during uh, the US uh, debt ceiling crisis. And there were several of them, um, but you know, uh, so be it. Um, so that's uh, two minutes earlier, but that's all I have. And I am eager to hear uh, what you think of this because uh, we are also kind of, uh, uh, all of us are excited about this project, but it's for us uh, sort of novel. Uh, it's a novel uh, literature for us. So we're not um, by no means experts in bargaining. Thank, thank you very much, Carlos. Excellent. That was uh, a, a lucid talk, I think. It, it's, it's easy to understand. Um, are there any questions? I have a few, but but I'll wait. Um, I had a quick one, if I may now. Hi, Elias. Hi, um, on. I was wondering, so here the search is just literally generating random proposals, right? But yeah. you could think in practice, at least in some cases, the search is to try to find some compromise that actually generates a larger pie for both parties, right? Is that is that something that could happen here? Because you'd think in that case as well, waiting longer increases the, the proposal you'd accept compared to the initial proposal. Yeah, so, so um, you're thinking that possibly with time, the spy is increasing, exogenously, yeah. is that what you're thinking? Or the um, proposals get better on average, right? instead of all being uniform every time you draw them. So some sort of kind of learning in a sense yeah. that we learn better to find better deals. So that's a possibility uh, we, we, which we could entertain, although uh, it would put some non-stationarity in the problem because the pie is increasing. But one way we could do is to at least have something less strong than that, have a pie, and we're thinking about that, a pie that is, uh, is a little stochastic. And so, you know, there could be, you know, you might want to wait because on some periods, maybe, you know, we find a way uh, in which um, things might work. Um, but um, yeah, uh, we're would thinking about that because it would, would give us maybe some more uh, uh, room to, to make some of the more things endogenous that we talked about before. Would uh, pi increasing just be different beta greater than mm -hmm. one? Or something if it's uniformly increasing something like that right so beta is the is the speed at which pi decreases in size so how about making it the opposite um now i don't think it's a, this is a you know this is like like uh, you know true, 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 right. so if, if the crisis increases deterministically yeah and uh, then it's probably just like a you know, an effect on beta essentially. Uh, and so you're right. So that's nice So we could have the pi maybe increasing deterministically, but with a stochastic component. And so separate the stochastic from the, the trend component there as the trend would go with the beta. So that's a good idea actually. And we could, uh, we could look at that as well. Uh, so, so it would be more general. Um, um, so along, this, along these lines, maybe also thinking about the uncertain, uh, I don't know exactly how you do it in your model, the uncertainty reducing over time, right? That the, the, the things get a little bit more clear as the process continues. So um, instead of getting, I mean, going back to your original model, a draw of X every time, you, you, the, the, the interval from which the axis can be drawn shrinks. Um, uh, in a way that's kind of dependent on, you know, like a Markov process, dependent on the previous periods uh, X, um, something like that. So that you know, you you could look at what happens if if that happens. Uh, yeah. I had other questions, but I'm gonna let people ask uh, before me. Any other questions? Because we'll, we we risk being dominated by Francesco. That's fine. That's fine. I hope it was clear. I'm I'm spaced out today because uh, yeah, couldn't sleep for I don't know why. <laughs> okay, go on, Francesco. So I um well, it, I think it's really a good idea to put this uncertainty on these exogenous proposals. I think it's it's actually. Uh, I wasn't aware of a Comte JL paper. I think this is a, a good innovation. 
I'm just wondering, going back to the original um, idea, whether, so there are two things. One, it would be interesting, I think, to, to let proposals be endogenous and exogenous at the same time. And what I have in mind is that um, perhaps uh, there is gonna be a correlation between what kind of proposal you have in mind and what kind of uncertainty you're going to generate. So in other words, um, thinking back about Brexit, certain proposals were more likely to be accepted by certain parts of parliament, others were less likely. So you could think of a model where you, by choosing a component of a proposal, you can also affect where the stochasticity, the stochastic component comes from. And the second question, which is unrelated, what is, um, if I understand the model correctly, you, you were talking about, you know, what if I can choose to bring in endogenously um, this, this brinkmanship? But if I understand correctly, uh, if I have an advantage, I, I have an incentive to bring it in and, and for, a, for a low edge, right? But then in response, the other side has an incentive to increase the edge. So if both sides can do this, uh, don't wouldn't the equilibrium prediction be that at some point you'd go back to a quite a high age if I mean if you take the model at face value? Yeah, so we, we haven't um, we haven't thought about how this you know we have to think about a model where how this H is generated uh, the H is dropped from the sky here and we say somehow if it's somehow it's there and it's low then the advantage agent really likes that, right? Uh, why is it low and why? Um, um, we don't know, we haven't modeled that, right? So, so that's, that's a, a limitation, that's a first step that's necessary, uh, right? In our model to know what happens for each age, that's what we do. But then uh, how is that age coming about? Um, we, we'll have to think about more, all right? Um, um, as for, uh, I didn't quite understand uh, the stochasticity of proposals. You know, it's evidently, you know, if proposals are more on, on one, they come out on more on one side of X. Then no, no, so the, in, your, in your model, you, you you basically have a pie. So that's kind of difficult, right? I, I probably have something more sophisticated as the bargaining space in mind. Something like, um, I know that if I, I make a certain proposal, uh, maybe my opponent is going to like it less, but maybe my parliament, which I also have to get agreement from, is going to like it more. So there is uh, uh, maybe proposals which are uh, closer to the boundaries of a set, to use the, the thing, but have less uncertainty about them. And others that are more in the middle, they're more compromising, but they have more uncertainty. Or, you know, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here. I don't have a a particular model in mind. But it seems to me that in these uh, situations, actually the, uh, there may be more than two sides and that the stochasticity comes from a factor that are outside actors, right? Here in this case, you negotiated, if you're the British government with the European Union, but you had at the background, your own parliament on one side, which is the one that was bringing a lot of uncertainty and on the other side, I suppose the European Union also had the national governments that they yeah. had to bring on board, right? So it, it's so. I guess what I have in mind is a situation where the negotiator, uh, the two gov the government and European Commission have quite a good degree of control over the proposals they make, but they don't have necessarily much control over what the outside actors that are not involved in negotiation are going to make of this proposal. Now, how to operationalize that into a model, I don't know. But uh, in a way, you guys, what you guys are doing are the, the two negotiating parties are, are basically getting random proposals and they have to you know, agree or, or disagree with that. Uh, and here I'm thinking of, of endogenizing the process a little bit and seeing whether you can, as a negotiator, try to, given these stochastic things that can change things, you can try to work out what, what's the best thing to do. Yeah, so, so I agree that um, we, would want, we would do want something a little more endogenous in this model because it's, it's too much is kind of an exogenous for now. Um, it's, a kind of, it's a good first step, 
but um, and it, and, it, and this is the, essentially the Comtech uh, setup. But um, too much is exhausted. But in any endogenous, more endogenous situation, we would want still some uncertainty, right? We would still want something that okay, well, we don't like this deal. Let's get another one, and we're not sure what we're going to get next because that's the only thing is going to get you delay in, in any bargaining model. So. Uh, that, that's kind of the trick there. And, uh, and the whole premise is that the people that are negotiating these things are, are, are you know, there's, there's a committee there, or if you think in any, uh, that there's a parliament, there's a committee of people on, on both sides that, you know, that are experts on the topic and negotiate and know a lot of, they have teams behind them, there's all technical details and then come out on a deep with a deal. And then it's brought to parliament and then parliament has all sorts of other considerations for more political stuff, right? And so th there is this tension, this separation between deals and, and, and often a lot of bargaining models don't standard, uh, you know, bargaining, uh, legislative bargaining, bargaining yeah, I, I mean, I, I think as an application, this already is om possibly almost enough, right? It's just that, uh, if you're going to, I mean, and as you said yourself, the, the endogenous thing is going to come up, people are going to bring it up and so on. So uh, maybe what I'm suggesting requires a, a new paper, a new model and so on. But um, that's what I would find most interesting, trying to endogenize the proposals a little bit, uh, if you're going to go further than this. Otherwise, I think what you have already is is pretty good. I mean, I'm not sure you have to do much more. Yeah, we have two things, like the proposals and the brinkmanship. So we don't know which one uh, should be. Yeah, I, I guess I'm saying the proposals, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose. Um, if there are no other burning questions that uh, require to be asked and answers uh, during the recording, Maybe we should uh, call it um, the end of this official part of the seminar. Thank you very much, Helios, for, for, for the talk and uh, the co-authors and the audience for a wonderful season. See you after the summer. Um, we can stop.